So I think we can just <laughs> we can just take uh, one or two quick questions to the presenters, and then we will start with the with the discussion. Please introduce yourself. I'm Maria Freire. Uh, I'm yeah. the president of the Foundation for NIH. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, as I said this morning, I'm here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I lost track. As I said this morning, uh, we've come a long way. And uh, I think the people working in this field should be amazingly excited about mm -hmm. it. When we first proposed the combination of several drugs, I thought people were going to fall uh, off their chairs. And look how far we've come. So yes. congratulations to everybody working in this field. Um, I wanted to ask about the trials. Are the trials going to be for populations that have uh, drug-sensitive or drug-resistant uh, tuberculosis? And I don't have very many regrets uh, from my TB Alliance days, but I do have one, yes. and that is the complete inability of addressing pediatric TB. Yes. So um, those are my questions. What kind of populations are you um, yes. focusing on and pediatric indications? And great questions. So right now the trials, as you've seen, are mostly focused on drug-resistant forms of the disease. I think I'll ask Jerry maybe to comment, um, if you will, um, on, on emerging studies. I think the idea of, of pediatrics is very important. We understand and are already thinking about bringing in a pediatric element to the TB data standard. Um, just so that we're able to collect those data um, and, and to be enabling as possible when those studies are launched. I think you've seen how auspicious the goals are that we have this far, and I think we've worked very hard not to get so distracted by, by, by taking on absolutely every problem that's in the field, but I think that is absolutely a level of consideration that needs to be brought forward. Jan? I'm Jan from the yeah. Gates Foundation. Uh, just to add, uh, Deborah, um, so Pediatric TB, uh, UNITAID has taken up that challenge and they've just made a substantial grant to the TB Alliance uh, to work on um, pediatric formulations and so on. Then obviously for the new drugs, uh, a pediatric development plan will be part of what's going to be asked for by, uh, by the regulators. And then on the drug sensitive versus drug resistant, um, that's where <coughs> We now realize that our, our primary goal still is drug-sensitive disease. Uh, but obviously, as we um, discover these new combinations, and these new combinations do not contain mm -hmm. neither isoniazid mm -hmm. nor rifampicin, mm -hmm. that actually mm -hmm. takes away the distinct, distinction between DS and DR. And, and there's now an ongoing trial with a um, moxifloxacin uh, PA24 uh, pyrazinamide combination in which, for the first time ever, uh, drug-resistant patients are included, as well as drug-sensitive patients. I mean, just as a comment, um, so I'd like to thank you for those kind words, Maria. <laughs> and, and I will just say, you know, I think the reason we've come a long way is that the Alliance had the vision at the outset of all this to put in train some of these things that are now coming to fruition. So, but as regarding the drug-sensitive and MDR question, just as a point of clarification, we will not be conducting any clinical trials within this within this uh, consortium uh, because I don't think IMI could possibly afford it. Um, <laughs> what we're rather more focused on is trying to develop the preclinical methods in such a way that we will be able to bring to the table early phase clinical designs that will act as a means of selection for for phase three trials. And as far as drug sensitive and MDR is concerned. It, we didn't really take a principled decision on that, but more a practical one, in the sense that much of the clinical trial data that's available, of course, relates to historical regimens or drug-sensitive disease. In the learning phase of the project, that's what we're focusing on. So we're focusing on drugs that some of, some of which have, in fact, found their way into the MDR regimen, like PAS and thiazetazone, streptomycin, and so on. Um, but in the second phase of the project, we, we don't take a view or, you know, on what we may or may not be able to evaluate, depending on what clinical trial data are available. But I predict that it will still be largely in the area of drug-sensitive disease, at least for the time being. But as Jan points out, that's a window that is going to close, we hope, uh, at some point soon. And when we won't have to make distinctions about how we treat patients as to whether or not they're resistant to rifampicin. 
Okay, um, now we start uh, with the panel. Oh, one more. It's a quick question. Okay, there's a lady there. Very quick, we can then we start. Yeah. I'm Tanya Bibler. I, I spoke the, uh, this morning, so I'm the lawyer in the room, so I might ask a little bit of a naive question here. So first of all, again, you know, congratulations. I think the global health world is really leading the world in terms of P PPPs and PDPs and in terms of establishing these kinds of consortia that are actually bringing products to market. So, you know, huge kudos there. Just a really practical question. How are you dealing with comorbidities? Because um, so, how are you dealing with uh, patients that may be on ARV um, or regimens, or you know, I, I mean, TB doesn't necessarily just occur in isolation. I'm just wondering how you're going to deal with that within your within your data sets. Right. So right now, in terms, and I can ask Klaus Romero also to comment. Right now, we are focused on control arm data for the purpose of developing a TB disease progression model. If you can believe it or not, we don't even have one of those developed yet for this disease that's been around forever. Um, and I'll ask Klaus to comment on how we'll deal with that with future data. Um, Klaus Romero, CPATH. Um, and, and you're right, it, it's, um, it, it, it becomes paramount to account for all the sources of variability in the data, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. if you want to develop an understanding, a quantitative understanding of how the disease progresses and eventually how the, how the drug components and the clinical trial components come into play, if you're going to develop something that will allow you to simulate clinical trials to inform the design of the next clinical trial, you need to account for all the relevant sources of variability. And if we're talking about combinations, drug-drug interactions are important, but both the good ones that are the intended ones for synergy to kill the bug and the not necessarily good ones. Um, and those pertain to both pharmacokinetic type interactions and pharmacodynamic type interactions. Some of the data sets that we are pursuing at the, at the moment have all the concomitant um, medication information with dosage and to a certain degree sparse PK for the, for, the, for the combinations. So it may not be perfect, but it's a start. And, and the, the more the standards evolve, yes. the more data we're going to be collecting that's higher quality to inform and refine the models. Right. So, so the big advancement is, is that we have a, a draft standard now that's out and being used and implemented for new trials and that our data standard team will continue to improve that data standard based on learning from those data sets. So we'll build in many of these... Um, questions or variables into that data standard that will help us to improve data collection and help us improve and validate those models going forward. And just as a comment I'd add, it, till now it hasn't actually been a major problem because in fact most people who have TB and have HIV were not getting antiretrovirals. Happily, now they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so most of the data that we're dealing with from the, the modern, the, the first line regimen that we currently have, HIV and administration of ARVs is not an issue. That will no longer be the case going forward. So developing a disease model for TB is complicated enough. When you start to bring into the picture pharmacokinetic in interactions with efavirenz and avirapine and antiretroviral drugs, it becomes infinitely more complicated. So that may be something that we're able to address towards the end of the project, we hope. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So now we uh, move on. And um, so there have been quite some work in the preparation of this uh, panel. And uh, people have been uh, really active in TC and the mails to try to define uh, some question that uh, uh, then we would like to, uh, the panelists to ask, uh, to respond and uh, make some statement for uh, around five minutes. And uh, first of all, we would like to say hello and thanks again to Geoff Turner that is um, being so kind to uh, meet by um, uh, remote, even if the weather over there is probably still very bad. Unfortunately, the colleague uh, Edward Koss could not join in. And uh, so I would like to, have to give the word to Joe, if he can start, and maybe we can also have the question again on the screen. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm the Associate uh, Director for Medical Affairs in the Office of Antimicrobial Products, and I'm also the FDA liaison to the CPTR. 
And um, we, we do recognize the, the valuable contributions the CPTR uh, is involved in in terms of TB uh, drug development. Uh, the um, uh, data standards uh, project uh, was a huge success and I think, uh, you know, moved in, in a very rapid pace um, the, um, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say that our, uh, my colleagues at FDA had also uh, had rolled up their sleeves and had, had gone to work uh, to help with this process. Um, and so I think that's an example where uh, uh, even in the relatively short period of time that the CPTR has been active since 2010, that a, you know, a deliverable has, uh, has, been, uh, has been achieved. Um, we uh, understand uh, the um, uh, interest in liquid culture and, and having a, a regulatory framework that's put in place uh, surrounding uh, the role of liquid culture, and uh, and and we are um, uh, we, you know we support and endorse uh, any amount of data that can help us best understand. Uh, liquid culture, and I would add that we can do our part to uh, 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 to um, have transparency in our thoughts about the liquid culture, and and we do have the experience of uh, of the Bedaquilin review. So I think we can do our part to make uh, uh, as transparent as we can our thoughts about liquid culture and the ascertainment of culture negativity, even within the context of. Uh, uh, the review of a new drug application. And we are interested in uh, non-clinical models that can help identify um, combinations of drugs, and we recognize that uh, uh, co-development of two or more investigational drugs is likely to be the future, and we are prepared for a review of those types of development programs. And so we... Um, uh, you know, we we welcome that and would would uh, encourage uh, uh, sponsors to work together and to bring to us uh, development programs that incorporate uh, two or more investigational drugs. And uh, and I'll end my brief comment uh, for right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manager. Is anybody of the panel who want to have an answer to Joe? Otherwise, I give the word to Bron. I just, uh, I, I would be, uh, I just want to thank you for that comment, really, because I think it's very, very encouraging to hear regulators inviting submissions about combinations of drugs. There have been some very uh, promising developments in terms of guidance that's been issued recently, but uh, I think the active engagement of regulators in making this happen is going to be absolutely critical. Sorry, Mark. Hello, my name is Baron Kitzler. I'm with CDISC, which you've heard that over and over today. I'm, it's nice to hear the consistent thread before I got up here. I don't have to explain as much. Um, CDISC stands for Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. And I just want to know how many before this morning and hearing CDISC throughout the day had heard of CDISC or feel like you knew what it is? Ah, excellent. That's more hands than I usually get. <laughs> So, so just in a nutshell, um, just a quick overview of CDISC. So CDISC is a standards development organization. We're a global nonprofit focusing on data standards for clinical research and clinical trials around the world. Um, so if you think about the clinical research data flow from collection all the way through regulatory submission, CDISC is working on data standards in those areas. You know, how is the data being collected on CRFs and ultimately how does that data look in a regulatory submission such as a submission to the U.S. Um, FDA. More, more recently, what CDISC has begun doing is working on these therapeutic area standards. Um, you heard about Alzheimer's earlier, you heard about tuberculosis. Um, to do this work, we're actually working on 10 therapeutic area standards right now or have released standards. Um, we formed a strategic partnership with the Critical Path Institute um, on this work. Um, so so CDIS, you know develops the data standards, but we work with the CPATH consortiums and all the partnerships in those consortiums. So it's, a, um, it's one of the best partnerships 
Um, I've been a lot of I've been a part of a lot of partnerships, and there's really good synergy and energy between um, this partnership. So we're working on tuberculosis. We have a release of a standard Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, polycystic kidney disease. Um, working on a project in hepatitis C. FDA is interested in a project on schizophrenia, cardiovascular disease, oncology. So a, as you see, there is momentum in this area. So where did this momentum come from? Why are C, DISC, and CPATH embarking on all this work? And uh, the, talking about these 10 projects, this just, it's just the very beginning of about 60 projects. We have a lot of work ahead of us. So, so where are the market drivers? Where is all this coming from? Um, one key market driver is coming out of the U United States. Um, so last year, the US FDA released a list uh, what they called um, 58 priority therapeutic areas for data standardization. So, so the FDA, I, I believe their process was looking upstream, saying, you know, what clinical trials are out there? What data is going to be coming in-house to the FDA over the years from around the world? And, and how do we get data standards up front um, you know, so, 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 data, so FDA can better handle the influx of this information and data. So they have 58 priority therapeutic areas that are up on the website. Tuberculosis is in the top tier priority. So this is a priority for the FDA um, as well. Um, there's also the FDA, what's called the PDUFA Regulation, Prescription Drug User Fee Act, um, which was signed by U.S. Congress and the President of the United States, which once again has a reference in there to these therapeutic area disease-specific standards. So, so the, there is, the, this, is, this is signed and passed by U.S. Congress and the President of the United States. There's dates in there about 2017. That's a huge market driver. Um, another market driver is out of IMI. So, um, I don't know, I, I think it's between 12 and 15 IMI projects are focused on therapeutic areas. Um, so CDISC, um, we also have a memorandum of understanding with IMI. Um, we are currently a partner on, on three projects and we're supporting other therapeutic area projects, um, particularly with CPATH, so we'll work closely um, with the Predict TB folks. So we'd, last thing we wanna do is reinvent the wheel between one project and something that's happening in the US and something that's happening in Europe. So that's, that's one, of, one of the jobs that CPATH and CDIS work on is, how do you triage these priorities around the world? So you, you get interest in these different projects and you have to prioritize and you have to create the right collaboration mechanism to get it all done. Um, another place where this market driver is coming from, um, there's 10 of the top world's global pharmaceutical companies have recently created um, an organization called Transcelerate Biopharma. Transcelerate Biopharma, 10 top global pharmaceutical companies in the world saying we are committed to work together through this organization. One of their key activities, data standards. One of the key activities under data standards, therapeutic area data standards. So, so there's three key market drivers. And then also the market driver that's most important to me is coming from the patient foundations. When you have a patient foundation or a doctor or leader of a patient foundation coming to you and saying, well, you know, we need a data standard. We have data here. We think there's better treatments for patients. We think there's better information we can learn from legacy data. Um, that's, that's powerful to me. So one of the questions I was, I was um, supposed to address is um, you know, what, what are the benefits and advantages of, of data standards? And you have to excuse me, I'll put down my mic for a second because I have a prop, okay? <laughs> so I'll talk louder. All right, so how many of you travel all over the world? Okay, right? Europe, you go to England, this is different. United States, this is it. You know, and, and the only way to, to make these plugs work together is to have some sort of a universal unit, okay? It, it's the same way with this data. I'm, I'm gonna give you a very specific use case. Um, CPATH and CDIS were approached by the Polycystic Kidney Disease Foundation. I know this is not a tuberculosis example, but it's a perfect example. We had a doctor um, with the PKD Foundation, who's a PK expert, treating patients, and he said, I have 20 years of legacy data through the foundation. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. He said, he said, I, I have 20 years, I don't need the prop anymore. He goes, I have 20 years of legacy data through the foundation. And he goes, I, he goes, I can't aggregate and pool that data. I can't analyze that data. But he had a hunch. He goes, I think there's new scientific findings sitting in all that data is not being used. And so through CPATH and CDISC, he said, can you build me a data standard? Can you build me this? The universal piece in the middle that allows me to plug all that disparate data together. 
Well, we did it. We created that standard, and he is. He's finding new biomarkers, and he's actually proving a new secondary endpoint for polycystic kidney disease based on old data that was sitting on the shelf. And he's taking this information now to FDA and, and EMA. So, so I mean, that, that's, that's just a perfect use case. Um, uh, another example is, once again, what I talked about with the FDA. They're getting data coming in from all over the world. How do they aggregate and pool and analyze this data? They need standards and they need tools. They're, today they're spending, and Chavare will agree, they're spending too much time pooling and analyzing that data and aggregating it. They want to spend more time in the actual review of the submission. Um, so, so anyway, that, that's, that's the key payoff. Um, but there's one more payoff. So you have old data that you need a, university, uh, a universal system to plug that old data into. Best bang for your buck, I'm not going to pick up the US score, is for all of us to be collecting the data in the same way. I, seriously. So after you create a data standard, you know, to aggregate that legacy data, if you can come to agreement around the world that we're all going to use the same plug, we're all going to collect data in the same way. That saves a tremendous amount of time aggregating all that data um, on the back end. So those are the, sort of the key, key two advantages. Um, do I have a little more time? Do you want me to talk about lessons learned or do you want me to circle back? Okay, one minute's worth. Um, so, so, so lessons learned. So CDISC and CPATH working in these 10 projects and tuberculosis, um, there's a number of key lessons learned. Um, one, of the, one of the key lessons learned is it is critical to have clinicians at the table in these discussions. And the problem is somebody says data standard, technical data standard, everybody's eyes roll back in your head. So, so, but you have, you have to get to the clinicians and you have to talk to the doctors and you have, I was telling Shabri this, you have to find a clinical champion, an expert in that therapeutic area who understands the value and benefit of data standards. And if you get him on board, you, you, you get other clinicians at the table. Um, we actually have Dr. Barbara Rath um, in here today who's working with me on a vaccine data standard. She gets it, and because she gets it, I can go talk to the technical standards geeks, and she can talk to the clinicians. So creating that bridge of communication is incredibly um, important. Uh, another thing that we've learned is if, you know, um, these projects are moving very quick. We're on very tight timelines now, between nine and 12 months to get a new standard out the door. And, and we're also working with a lot of volunteers. Sometimes it's, it's really hard to manage volunteers that tightly. So what I've found one key ingredient that really keeps everybody focused. If you can get a patient advocate sitting on that data standards program, representing that disease, I'll tell you what, that really focuses everybody. Um, um, on, on a project, we have somebody on the board who actually suffers from Parkinson's disease. And she stood up a couple weeks ago, and she's, all these data standards projects are great. Aggregating all this data is great. She goes, but she goes, the one thing I don't have is time. She goes, I am dying. So, so if you have a patient advocate with that disease on those teams, it absolutely creates the focus that you need. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Marco Cavalleri from uh, European Medicine Agency. Um, uh, okay, so um, very briefly, I will start saying that DMA supports both CPTR and the PredictB as very valuable initiative in order to progress and advance the regulatory science aspect, which is not the only point, but is an important one that is embedded in the programs. And therefore, we're keen to be engaged as much as we can and as appropriate with respect to both these initiatives. So I would start saying this, which I think is not irrelevant. Uh, then I would say that in terms of what could be uh, the regulatory use of the data and the efforts that will be coming out from this uh, consortium, I think uh, clearly from the side of the translational science, we need to um, strengthen the PKPD appraisal of uh, uh, novel drugs for TB. Uh, not only single drugs, but also drug regimen, as has been said. And it's very important that this is, is coming up uh, and is clearly among the goals of both initiatives. Uh, this is very important not only for developers in order to make their own decision in terms of how to progress, how fast to go uh, with uh, their programs, but also from a regulatory standpoint in order to be very informative with respect to the dosage, 
the length of treatment, the schedule to be used, and last but not least, of course, the drug regimen that are going to be uh, used in, uh, in clinical trials. And of course, uh, it's, it's extremely important that particularly the early phase of the development are very much informative because when it comes to the late clinical development, it will be very difficult to test for all the various variables and to enter into factorial design style approaches. So therefore, we do realize how important it is and uh, we do think that the PKPD should be strengthened as it is occurring right now for antibacterials in general when we think about uh, new antibiotics for using nosocomial infection. Uh, the other important point, which I do recognize a bit more difficult, but of course extremely valuable for us as regulator, is, uh, is the validation of biomarker to be used as surrogate marker when it comes to approval in, uh, of new drugs or regimens, and so to be used in pivotal and confirmatory trial. And that is an area that we will be very keen to see progress as well, as indeed this will have the tremendous advantage of shortening the approval uh, time frame for such drug and also in terms of access to this important medicine for patients that are highly in need. Uh, this, of course, uh, must rely very much on the availability of clinical trial data, and I say the contemporary clinical trial data possibly, and that is probably the major challenge. But we should not uh, neglect the relevance of this. And uh, as said also, uh, when it comes to drug regimen, of course, the EMA is very much keen to enter into dialogue and to engage with developers in order to see the best way forward for developing new regimens. We do believe that is uh, quite a rational approach. We will have to look into the details of it all and to see from the regulatory standpoint if there will be no problems at the end of the, of the program when it comes to approval. But that is quite important. And the uh, other two aspects maybe to mention, uh, pediatric TB is also quite of an issue. As you know, the pediatric regulation in Europe uh, um, asks for clinical trials to be conducted by developers. Therefore, it's quite important that there are efforts put also in that direction in order to understand what is the best way forward when it comes to pediatric development for new TB drugs or regimens. And also last, I would mention from the safety side, uh, clearly also considering the, the idea of uh, developing new drug regimen, consideration must be given also to some important aspect, like we know that many of the TB drugs uh, cause QTC prolongation as an example, and it would be important to put effort there in order to predict as much as possible what would be the risk associated with a certain combination, which again is not a minor point. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so now I think if we get uh, the question again, and then uh, I would like just to ask to uh, Joe if he has uh, some more comment after having listened to the other member of the panel. Uh, hi, I think, uh, wh why don't you just uh, go forward with the questions and I can provide additional comments. Okay, then we can start with the first uh, question. Are there opportunities that you see for synergy leveraging the output of both efforts? And that would be really useful since tomorrow we will have to dive deep down and try to get to some concrete way to do this. Oh, there is a question also. Alistair, Alistair Benbow from The Age of the Brain. So this isn't my area of expertise, as you can tell, and it may be a naive question. Um, you talked uh, right at the beginning, Jerry, I think it was, uh, about in-the-field activity. Uh, in, in, it's not directly related to this, but it could become very important. Um, what's being done in the field to address the, the compliance adherence issues that, that could become so critical for you when new regimens get to the patients? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, the assumption, of course, I think, is that if we had a regimen that was only two weeks, the compliance issues would go away. <clears throat> I'm not sure that's entirely true. Um, but if we did have shorter, more tolerable regimens, uh, then people felt better more quickly, perhaps that would help. Um, that is one of the major issues that we have with the current therapy being so long, is that it's very, very difficult to keep people on it. Uh, and if they don't complete, they don't get cured. Um, in terms of clinical trials and improving adherence, there are uh, some efforts to find ways to, to help people take their TB drugs uh, more effectively. 
it works quite well in HIV, I must say, and there's been a lot of activity in that area of research, but in TB, a bit less. And it tends to revolve around pairing somebody up with a family member or a friend or their employer in order to support them, in order to remember to, to take their tablets. That's, that's mainly what's been done. Okay, so that if we go back from, uh, from the question, so uh, we would like to really to ask to the audience and uh, really um, from the presentation that you have heard from the two initiatives, uh, can you help us out and uh, from your perspective and uh, what are you think the more key opportunity for synergy leveraging of these two efforts? Do you have uh, any input here that would be more welcome? And here I see you. Thank you. So, uh, I, I don't want to be flippant about it, but I think when, when you listen to the presentations, uh, they're all about synergy and leveraging the efforts of both projects, but they're highly conceptual. I mean, these are great ideas, great concepts, and so to me, the, the answer to the first question is actually found in the answer to the third question, because I do believe that it's going to be completely be successful or fail, depending on the data sharing um, that actually is necessary before you actually achieve synergies. And that's where my concerns lie a bit, because the different participants, academics, companies, organizations like ourselves, um, IMI itself, you know, the Lisbon Agenda and all of that, uh, where, where I think we need to be, be, be careful. And, and, and make sure that we have true alignment about the purpose of this. So thanks for that comment. I think it, it's, it's interesting. This is something that we've been worrying about for, for a while now, that we have a database, we have a data manager, and we are beginning to have interactions with people who are not in the consortium about where the data is coming from. And remember, some of the data is on paper cards. Okay, so there's even a transcriptional, it's not even that they won't hand over an Excel file or a database. Um, and I, I think what's becoming increasingly clear to me, which you may say is vi rather naive, but we'll say it anyway, is, is we need people at your level, Michelle's level, to, to lobby and ensure that people understand the value of what we're doing. And we also need to make sure that we don't get consumed by the kind of altruistic good that a, group, a big consortium we think brings to the world and remember that that individual has striven very hard to get those data and to stay engaged with them and I think that's really difficult and as I've said to I think you Jan perhaps other people one of the things that we've done on a superficial basis is interact with people from WARN. WARN is the worldwide anti-malarial resistance network funded um, and run out, run out of Oxford University and they have a number of parallels um, between um, us and them in terms of the data transfer agreements that they had, the generic issues they have with getting people to be altruistic with their data, often long after they've ever done anything with it. It's long, long published. So, so that's kind of our strategy is, is in evolution. We require you to help us, but we also don't need, we need the carrot as well as the stick. Yeah, okay. Hello? Okay, it's working out. Um, so as far as data sharing, um, I'm, I'm just wondering on, on CPR, other projects that we've seen, once you get organizations starting to share data, it puts pressure on the other organizations to start, start sharing the data. So I, I don't know if Deborah, if somebody else wants to answer. So I know CDC is sharing some data, some pharmaceutical companies are sharing some data. Are, are you seeing an uptake now? Is that creating the friendly pressure needed um, to, to get that data sharing going? So, so I do think we're starting to generate some energy in this area. I think where I am more concerned um, is where we're going to be seeking data sharing with academicians. Right, where their careers, their publications, their grant applications are reliant on the proprietary nature of their data. And we need to find a way to make a case that this is of benefit to them and make sure that it is, or else we won't be successful. And again, I think this is where we have to really think through the strategy, the legal strategy, 
at the very highest level of these efforts, um, it, it makes it harder that we developed our independent legal approaches at very different times without the broader vision to come together in the end, which is just the nature of the beast, right? Um, you, you know, so again, I, I don't trivialize that this is going to be a, a difficult thing, but I think especially in a field like TB, with this being a global disease, we have to find a way to data share, because if we can't do it, I don't believe anyone else will. Because I, 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 just two comments, really. I mean, the first is that the success that you've had and, and that CDISC has had with interacting with TBTC and CDC, that really gets things moving. And our interactions that we've had with the British MRC as well means that a lot of the historical data sets that exist are we are already quite far on in negotiations for access and we're assisting them with actually doing data entry and so forth. And once you have a database of that size, which would be of the order of more than 10,000 patients, let's put it that way, um, then from, for, from a pharmaceutical company's perspective or from academic trialists, you know, it's going to become, it, it will be normalized that it will be expected by funders that you would contribute to, to a database of that sort. So I think that's very, very important. And I don't want people to be too negative either because we've done some data sharing exercises in pharmacokinetics in TB. It's a lot easier because there aren't that many of us. <laughs> Um, and we mostly know each other, but nonetheless, you know, we've managed to get more than 65% of all the data that exists on rifampicin PK, for instance, into a database, at, you know, and we're modeling that data. So it, it can be done, and I think it does help, as was said earlier, that it's, that it's a neglected disease, that it's a global health priority, and that most of the companies involved in the field are more or less doing this work pro bono. So I think that, that does help to facilitate data sharing. I could add just one other point. So we're talking mostly about clinical data, but we've talked a lot about the importance of validating these preclinical models. And I think one very positive sign that we have um, in, in talking with my working groups prior to this meeting, um, you know, Justin alluded to the fact that with those preclinical models, there is a real advantage to having some duplicative or overlapping data because a huge concern for those models are it variability between lab to lab and lab sites across the globe. Several of our investigators, academic investigators that participate in our working groups, many of whom you know, are very willing to share their data in order to have that comparative work done because it's to their advantage, it's to the advantage of the field. So I think those are the very early signs in addition to the fact that we're getting CDC data, we're getting NIAID data, we are, we are starting to work with companies around gathering data, that we're moving the needle on both ends. And I just think we need to continue to put pressure and find that carrot and, and really to get some legal framework put around this because it will be required. Okay, great. So I think really now we have the first uh, really starting point for tomorrow discussion that will be really how we're going to go with this data sharing and only when we manage to have this data sharing and to map the two initiatives, then we will be able to identify the critical gap and see how we can, you can work together and synergize on this. And I would like to put to the next slide where we have two more questions, please. And really here, I think, Jerry. Thanks. So... Um, in the lead up to the, to the meeting, I spoke to some people in the room and, and some other people, particularly people who don't work in tuberculosis but do work in both regulatory and, and, and the statistical side of things. And um, one of the things that came across was, and I, and I made this point at the beginning, is that actually the use of these drugs, let, let's be quite frank, is, is not in the European Union and North America, that the biggest impact that they'll have is in countries like China, India, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, that we, we heard a comment about HIV. And I guess my question to, to Joe and Marco is, is, is really how are we as a, you know, I think we need to see this as a, you know, as a, how are we going to support those regulatory agencies um, to ensure that the correct regimens are used in the in the right patients I, I think that's that's kind of my take on on the question we 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 really need to understand this i i think it's no no surprise that this is one of the biggest concerns for companies which is you know are we going to have to repeat this 
over and over again with slightly different data to, sli to, to different cu countries because that's definitely what's happening in other areas, uh, more mature areas of, um, uh, of, of uh, pharmaceutical medicine whereby regulatory agencies are asking, this is, n this is not outside of EU um, FDA, are asking for slightly different bits of data so you're always playing catch up with your data um, and I think that within the scope of tuberculosis that's already very challenging to collect those data um, and whether we would have to repeat trials in each individual country is, is not something necessarily we can do. Okay. Jo uh, first. Okay, Joel, can you do you like to comment? So maybe I will okay. start. Can we find him find him again? <laughs> Run away. <laughs> well, first of all, I will start saying that uh, TB exists in Europe and MDR-TB as well, so there is a need of new drugs in Europe. If you think about the situation in Eastern Europe and the Baltic is really quite bad, I would say. Um, and that's the, why, uh, that's the reason why also new TB drugs uh, um, often receive orphan drug designation in Europe, because there is an unmet need there as well. Uh, clearly, as is happening across different areas, and again I have to go back to the antibacterial uh, um, field where we have a lot of discussion with the FDA, the same is occurring in the area of TB. So we happen now to discuss more and more frequently with our colleagues at the FDA and we all do recognize that these studies are going to be global. Just look at the most recent trial, the sites are in some European country, maybe Russia, maybe some uh, southern and north northern eastern Asia and South America. So it's quite clear that uh, it's, it's really difficult to think about having to replicate any of these studies. So these trials are really global and we should find, as we are being successfully doing so far, we are finding a way in which uh, uh, these uh, uh, trials and confirmatory trial or large trial for registrations are really agreed by both agencies. Um, of course, uh, there are a number of issues, particularly when it comes to the setting of MDR-TB, because there we have uh, um, a lot of problems around understanding what uh, is, the, is the current efficacy of the standard of care. And that's for us as regulators is a big issue because uh, this means that we don't know exactly at the end of the day what the comparator arm, how, how much will perform and what will be the efficacy there. And as you know, there is also, we are also quite engaged with the WHO. We often discuss with them uh, and uh, we try to understand what is their position. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, in order to try to figure out uh, pivotal trials that could also be informative for the WHO when it comes to make their recommendation in other parts of the world. Even if we do recognize that sometimes it's quite difficult with a single pivotal trial to address all the issues and to answer all the questions, particularly when it comes to different drug regimen, if we are talking, as we have been talking so far, about a single drug approval. Things might change if we enter into this uh, new paradigm of uh, uh, drug regimens, but since for the time being we are still with a single drug approval, we are still talking mainly about MDRTB, and there indeed there are a number of issues that uh, are quite of a challenge for regulators. In fact, for us it would be great if any consortia would be able to generate uh, contemporary data with respect to what is the outcome in the setting of MDRTB, XDRTB, pre-XDRTB with the current standard of care. Also in light of the fact that with the standard of care even the duration of treatment is not defined and that also creates some problems when it comes to try to progress uh, into new approaches that would uh, shorten also the duration of treatment with, uh, with new drugs and how you're going to look at them. Superiority trials but then if you're going into non-inferiority it's extremely difficult to define any margin. Then that's a problem. Thank you very much. I think Marta has some comment. From Critical Path Institute, um, I'm going to touch on a slightly different aspect of, of kind of the, the regulatory pathways as we see them. We have been working very closely with um, the World Health Organization's Stop TB Department and uh, Limit Rego at the Essential Medicines Department, and having conversations about enabling 
a pathway for regulators, particularly those who are resource constrained in the high TB burden countries, to come together and have some type of a joint discussion, probably needing to be led by FDA or, or EMA as they tend to look um, to you guys as, as uh, kind of the gold standard. But there is receptivity to even discussing clinical trial designs with them as we start new programs. So if, if the earlier we can start the dialogue with these agencies, I think the greater likelihood that there'll be more compatibility and less country by country requirement. What it's gonna depend on, however, is a sponsor being willing to step forth and put their hand up and say, yeah, I'll, I'll pilot this and we're gonna be uh, twisting arms to, to do our best to make that happen. I think we have time for one more question or comment. Yeah. Just, okay. a, just an open question. I was just wondering when I was listening to your talk, uh, what has been learned from the experience, uh, groundbreaking experience with uh, developing HIV drugs? I know HIV is a fast-growing organism, but there were certain moments when t uh, biomarkers, you would say, we didn't call them that way, <laughs> were developed like viral load measurements, resistance testing, uh, the HIV drug resistance database that was open source and, and helped anybody to, to figure out, you know, what the, what the virus was doing. Um, so, of course, TB is a horribly <laughs> slow-growing organism and, and it's much harder to come up with uh, fast assays, but uh, is there anything you can use from the HIV experience that will benefit the TB world? Apparently I won the tug of war with the microphone. Uh, wh whilst I'm very jealous of my HIV colleagues who sit next to me and bath in the glory of the soon to be licensed, hopefully dolutegravir, um, I, I think we have to draw some parallels um, and then realize that there are some major differences. So, so the parallels um, and the jealousy is that they have an excellent biomarker, okay? So viral load links to CD4 count and that links probably to, to disease outcomes. Um, so, so that's good. Um, I think one of the issues that we should recognize in HIV though is that they are in the same place as we are, although they've done it much more often, which is that they've done serial drug registration with then combinations subsequent to that. And they don't have quite the issue potentially with, with resistance developing by the time that they do their studies because their studies are 24 to 48 weeks long. And so they don't have that issue. So, so whilst I have lots of, lots of time for, for learnings from HIV and, and certainly at GSK and Janssen and, 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 and one or two other of the big companies, we do have the ability to learn from them. Um, and we're currently surrounded by their success and understanding the way that they've developed that big, big program at, at, at Viv, GSK and, um, and Shionogi. I think that, that, that we have to understand that there are, there are differences. That's all I'll say. Um, Chavre Buckman Garner from FDA. Just a very quick question. Um, one of the comments that was made just now was about harmonization between the reg regulatory agencies and the challenge that we're developing this for an environment that isn't in the EU or the US largely. How much do those other regulatory agencies know about these activities that are going on? That's the first question because I think that's something that's a communication point ca that can be done without resources so that they're aware. And then I like what Martha's saying about trying to host some sort of collaborative forum so that we can get some level of harmonization. But I think the first piece is this is a tremendous amount of work reaching out to them in a very targeted way so they understand the impact and how it can benefit them. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's an excellent idea. I'd just suggest that there is one uh, large co country quite a long way from here that's just closed its entire regulatory agency and is not actually telling us when they're going to open so we can't even do the trials we want to do at the moment so I think it's fantastic we have great great difficulties interacting in the in the same collaborative way that we do with FDA and EMA and that that's very that that's really my experience in malaria trials where we we have another program and we work with MMV and MMV have a big big interaction with all of these agencies so i agree conceptually great idea delivering on that sometimes tricky 
This may be an area where FDA or, or EMA can help you if you get the language for the messaging together. We can help with the outreach. This is something very cheap that we can do. So just something to think about. If they're not hearing you, maybe they'll hear us. And, and, and that's great, yeah. Shavri. Um, one, of the, one of the best examples I have seen of, of EMA, FDA coming together with other regulatory agencies around this um, is when the Global TB Alliance holds their open forums. Um, so uh, a couple years ago, they did an open forum in Addis Ababa, um, Ethiopia, which, which, which is spectacular. It gave you know, all these African countries access to the discussion be, because it was held there. So I think those types of forums are critical. So, Martin? <laughs> Someone stole the microphone. No, I just, I just um, wanted to say, uh, you may not know this, Chavre, but actually um, we are in the process of sending to the NRAs from the 22, I think it is, high burden countries, all of the review materials from FDA that you've loaded on your website, along with a video of the advisory committee. Um, we met with them in October and told them this was going to happen, and we've invited them to come to your CEDAR forum in June. Um, Justina Molzon is going to use the Bedaquilin review as a case study. So you guys have already been tremendously helpful, so I just want to thank you for that. Thank you very much, Marta. I just would like to ask uh, Joe that seems to have uh, managed to join in again if he has some more comments. Dis disappear again. So, okay, so I think we have a. To add that, uh, as, as Mara knows, we, we are looking also at what the WHO has been doing in the area of vaccine with the AVRF initiative and try to bring in the countries then where the trials will be run in order to look uh, with them into the, the clinical trial protocol and eventually the approval of these, of these trials, which uh, I think it's, it's a very good example and a very good initiative. And of course, the WHO should be the place where all these efforts should be brought together. And I do believe that also what CPTR is doing in this sense is extremely valuable. Great. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to wrap up this session. Thank you and everything, everybody again. Uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, thank the people that... Uh, try to connect from remote and Mart, of course, and now we give the floor to our two directors.